G'day, guys. How are you going? Enjoy Thanks, mate. Your day. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you. If Louise was one of those little Mr. or Miss characters, she'd be Miss Positive. How's training going? Yeah, really good, thanks. L Louise, oh, she's got a massive heart. She's got massive soul. Uh, she loves to give. She likes to connect people. She likes to help people. Hi, guys, it's Lou here. She's well known as an expert commentator. Do we want to do a sound check of work good? And then also as a great coach. Thank you. But three years ago, Louise started coaching a very different player. So we've got Novak first. Like, we're practising at Woolloomooloo and he, um, he's like, who are we practising against today? And I, you know, I'm like, let's do the top ten. We just would come up with this game where we played all the greats. So now we're playing Rafa. He's got a really good serve. I think some people in my life thought I was certainly getting too involved with somebody that has their highs and lows. Sorry, I got angry with you. No, I, you. I understand. I know things can be tough. So just hang in there, buddy. Her safety was definitely a concern, you know. We, we didn't know Brian. You've been sleeping, you know, in difficult places and on the street, and you are starting to put everything together. And you will never disappoint me because we're in this together. I had no one in my life that was able to help me. There was no one in my life I could trust. Well, she gave me hope. Give me hope that there's somebody out there. and a half years ago, I guess, I started volunteering at St. Kenneth's. Just one of those? There we go. Enjoy. It's right near King's Cross. It's in one of Sydney's most disadvantaged areas. My partner, actually, Charlotte, said, look, they have a great program here, a reach-out program where they feed the homeless. Some days we feed up to 300 people. It's amazing. And they all catch up together, and they know that this is a constant. She spent so much of her life to date, you know, really driving her career. I feel like she now can give her time to someone else. You're looking good today, hey? You feeling good? I've spoken to jockeys, I've spoken to singers, I've spoken to amazing people, a scientist I met, but just all of these people that somehow had just fallen off the edge. One Wednesday, I was doing my regular shift. You've been strong this week. And this gentleman walked up to me and he just looked at me and he said, I know who you are. He said, I've seen you. And I said, oh, OK. What's your name? And he said, Brian. Can you just say, you just say thanks for, for... Oh, my God. Thanks for the 20 He's a character, isn't he? I got the shock of my life. Dead set. Soon I'll tell you a bit. I said to her, what the are you doing here? You should be coaching tennis. And then that's how the relationship started. I went and sat down with him and I was quite shocked actually because this gentleman had this beautiful racket bag and he opened it up and he showed me the most two precious Wilson, Jimmy Connors, I think they were R2000s or something, and he had three tennis balls in there and I thought, OK, this guy just loves his tennis. And then I said, do you want to play or do you want to hit? And she said, yeah, we'll have a hit. That was it. This is very Raphael Nadal, this one. Where, where did you get this outfit from? <laughs> so the very first hit that we had, I got down there at 7 o'clock. Oh, no rest, straight away, straight into it. Remember Big Kev? I'm excited. Brian was very good. Bring it on. Had an unbelievable slice backhand. Shot. Shot. Played very flat, old school. Oh, nice. First time we hit together, I don't know whether she was surprised I hit the ball so well or I didn't expect too much, but um, we hit well together and enjoyed each other's company. You're too excited. You'll never hit me. I felt like we had this real connection. I like that shot. There was something about him. 
he was homeless and had his um, sleeping bag there, and yet here he was on the tennis court and his passion for tennis just blew me away. I go walk the streets and pick up clothes, anything that was worth it. Yeah. And fit in. Assemble it all. I sleep there on the leaves. Yeah. I was virtually sleeping behind the shed at Rushcutter's Bay, weather permitting, of course, in the grandstand or anywhere. So you have to carry everything that you need all the yeah. time? All with me. Had his sleeping bag and, and all of his tennis rackets and things, and, uh, yeah, I, I pretty much learnt pretty quickly um, what homelessness is about. Right. What do you got here? Just clothes. Players, there's a, I always carry one ball with me. <laughs> so you can hit on a wall? Well, Anywhere? Ball. Any wall? Yeah. He gave me all of his bank cards. I'll go ahead and get someone's house. He yeah. said, can you look after these? He gave me all sorts of paperwork. Give me all the money. No, 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 no. I'm not giving you all the money <laughs> because you'll spend it. I really wanted to be there for him and I wanted to help him. So how did you get into tennis? I watched Rod Laver. That's how I got into it. Rod Laver and Newcomb and the guys like Rochi, yeah, they were my idols. Right. We had a coffee together and Brian started to tell me his life uh, kind of tennis story. Brian was born near Gosford. He grew up near there. He was a very good athlete with everything. I represented the school in every sport I could get my hands on. And everyone used to call me Mr. Baseball. Played for New South Wales seven years in a row, shortstop pitcher. Brian started playing tennis at about nine. He joined some tennis uh, clinics that were run by Charlie Hollis, who coached uh, Rod Laver and many great players. I used to travel around everywhere looking for players in a caravan. This was Charlie Hollis. It was 24 kids on half a court. That's where he lived. And if you didn't get it right, he'd run around and tap you on the legs with a feather duster. And I could really relate to so many things that he was telling me. Like Brian, I grew up in a very small town, Tamora, New South Wales, not too far from Wagga Wagga. We grew up in a very religious family, very Catholic. We really had instilled in us values of giving, of service. My father had a bread van. At the end of the day, we would drive around and give all the leftover bread to families that were probably struggling. Louise was the ultimate sportswoman. I mean, she would excel at anything she turned a hand to. I used to play softball for New South Wales. Brian played for New South Wales in baseball, and we played the same position, funnily enough. I was six years of age when I first went to a tennis camp. The very first time I saw Wimbledon was Yvonne Goolagong winning Wimbledon. And from that moment, I thought, OK, this is what I really want to do. She left home when she was 15 or 16, took off into the world, taking it on by herself. If she came back to train, the local television TV crews uh, would be down there filming her training. When Louise Fleming left her Wagga home 16 years ago to chase her dreams as a tennis professional, she was happy enough to be competitive to make a living. She's done that and some more and established herself as one of Australia's top doubles players. I was probably in my late 20s when I realised I wasn't going to be number one in the world, but uh, I knew that I could make a living from it. Beautiful service action with Louise Planning. I played for New York Buzz. I played with Martina Navratilova on the team. And I made a lot of really good friends through playing tennis and having doubles partners. It really was like a, a family being on the tour. Maybe I didn't achieve greatness in tennis, but I felt there was something else that tennis was always going to bring me. Probably for Brian, you know, it wasn't so easy for him. Brian was about 13 when I first started coaching him. He was very, very well liked. Probably about uh, the age of 22, he decided, right, I'm going to go over and play on the European money tour and circuit and give it a go. So how did you get from Australia to Europe? How did you... Right. Right, so... <laughs> how do you I... get to Australia to Europe? Yeah, well, you're funny, aren't you? <laughs> no, but... So you played here a little bit, and then you you were playing these tournaments. We had to go to France 
and play smaller tournaments to get a bit of pocket money. Oh, it was fantastic. It was just like backpacking with half a dozen tennis rackets under your arm. It was great. Over time, he started to win tournaments, and I think that gave him a lot of confidence. Once Brian came back in 84, he, uh, he changed a little bit. He was saying things that were out of the ordinary, a little bit like a, a mental breakdown. He came back saying uh, you know, he was able to uh, beat uh, McEnroe, uh, Borg. Now, these were statements that uh, were completely untrue, but uh, he thought he could, and so it was a bit of a shock for people. He was really talking this story of grandeur that he, you know, was going to go out and win Wimbledon. I was real excited. My parents thought I was on drugs. Mum said, go to the doctor. So I went to the doctor. Police there wait for me. So they locked me up. He was put into a psychiatric hospital. I think it was Morissette. And I don't think Brian really saw that coming, and I don't think he was happy about that. But I think that's where, particularly his mother, um, really wanted to get some help for Brian. That changed a lot of things for him. He was never going to go to the next level of where he thought he was going to go. Well, the, the stigma about mental illness then was bloody terrible. Now, these days, everyone's got a mental illness, so it's not that bad. But the stigma was terrible. So it was like a leper. So that was then you couldn't get on tennis courts or you I couldn't. Didn't want it. Just, you were too just too depressed. Answer the phone, would go out the front door. Yeah, he talked about his suicidal thoughts and his depression. Uh, so I think, yeah, life was very tough for him. His tennis career was over. You never saw him as much around the courts. The mood swings that he had were quite uh, daunting for people because he was a big man. I'm the worst person to be around when I'm angry because I'm not actually angry at other people, I'm angry at myself. Apparently I'm very intimidating without opening my mouth. Some people have told me you're a big unit and don't do the wrong thing by a big Brian, but they don't realise I'm really soft. He was doing a little bit of carpentry work. He was doing a little bit of coaching. There were times where he was back, you know, in psychiatric hospitals for stints, but he also was living on the street at times. Yeah, I come to a place like Wayside Chapel to get um, a bit of support, get second-hand clothing and shoes and showered and cheap food and that. And then I go out and find somewhere to sleep at the end of the night probably in the park or on the railways. You know, a couple of times he'd been to jail. I think his best friend was the tennis wall. The wall was pretty much always there and he could go and hit his 200 balls. He was certainly burning the bridges uh, because of the illness. The tennis world is a very, very close-knit family, but uh, once Brian did get ill, I um, mean, that tennis family that, that had known him, they didn't want to know him as such. Ready for a big challenge today? So by the time I um, started playing tennis with Brian, he talked about how many years it had been since he'd really kind of had some serious tennis in his life. I've been waiting 35 years today. Whenever Brian and I were on the court, I feel like I'd always get the best out of him. You're gonna try to hit me, make sure it's going in the, the square. I just felt through tennis we could really do something and I could really be a positive influence in his life. Hang on a minute. Wait. I feel Superman when I'm playing tennis. Oh! Is that 10 or is that 10? As soon as I walk on a tennis court and got a racket in, I'm happy as Larry. You know, I don't know exactly what it was or, or how you'd explain it, but for two people who were living different lives, such polarised lives. Yeah, great shot, thank you. To see that connection was um, pretty amazing. Nice and deep, I like that. They've obviously got that shared experience. Louise definitely does see some of herself in Brian and how easily it is to potentially fall down. I'm loving the spin there, mister. Beautiful. I was trying to get on the court as often as I could. 
Brian always said he wanted to go back on the tour and he wanted to get fitter and he wanted to go and play against the best players. He had these illusions of playing on the international circuit. All right, let's go. So we used to do the stairs in Woolloomooloo. We'd run through parks and that sort of thing. He's a bit slow, sorry. He was pretty fit for a guy that's homeless. If we went up the butler stairs and I said, they're not stairs. I showed her the other staircase and she couldn't handle them. Come on, last one. Let's go. You pull me up this one. Come on. I had to carry up the last, last bloody journey. That's how good she was. My mother died too soon. She's all right three months ago. Some days it's very calm and very easy and it's fun and exciting. And then some days it's very challenging. I'd go to hospital and find oh, you better go up to see the registrar. I said, what for? Oh, your mother passed away last night. Seeing that level of agitation and what Brian was going through was an eye-opener. And I became concerned, like, um, is she putting herself in danger? He's upset. Yeah, he just wants someone to listen to, and that's the toughest bit, because I guess after a while, when you have highs and lows, like, everyone is there for a minute, and, and then it just seems like there's a cycle of friends going in and out the door. The first time I met Brian, I was a little bit intimidated. He's a very tall man and a strong man and obviously, you know, lives on the street and can look after himself. So I was a little bit intimidated. Look at his feet. Looks like a shark's bit me. No, that's enough. That's from back and people. <laughs> I think a lot of people would have just turned their back on Brian. You know, sometimes he hasn't always treated her kindly or had nice conversations and she's just kept going back. Oh, hi, Nathan. It's Louise Fleming here. I just wanted to touch base. I'm heading overseas on Thursday. Um, and I know Brian's going to be up in your area. I was just wondering if we might be able to just get someone who could um, hit with him a little bit when he's up there. A few weeks after I met Brian, I had to then leave to go to Paris to commentate at the, at the French Open. I had concerns that when I was going to go away that he'd slip back a little bit. You know, the best thing to do is just send me an email and I can look at it because I've got to just check the rostering. A lot of time was dedicated to helping Brian. Yeah. She was definitely spending a lot more time with him than, you know, the young professional athletes that she had been working with. No, I just want to make sure, like, obviously I'm leaving tomorrow, so I want to make sure that... I'll be there before you. ...that everything's going to be OK. Do you give me that paperwork back? I'll be there before you. All right. I just had the feeling that he was already getting very anxious that I wasn't going to be around, and, yeah, he didn't have that same support. And also, I can pay someone Thank to you. hit with you a couple no. of days. What yes, for? Because I don't want you to, to lose what we've set up. Well, we've... Trade me with you, then. Frank <laughs> he just so wanted to go to a Grand Slam, but was really trying to manage those expectations and just bring them down a little bit to a place which were re more realistic. <laughs> we had arranged this final hit. Hey, that was awesome. I'm pretty impressed, mate. You have stuck with it for four weeks. We can continue this, but, um... Yeah, I'm just... Yeah, well, you know, I'm back in seven weeks. I can handle it. Yeah, I had certainly my concerns of how things were going to be. Hi, Joe. It's uh, it's great to join you in yes. this match. Hi, Louise. I was away for a couple of months. Brian would often phone and I'd pick up the phone. I'd say, Brian, I'm just about to commentate a certain match. I'd be at Wimbledon or somewhere. I'm here with Cindy Schmeller. I'm Louise Fleming. Great match here, Cindy. This number 10 C. I'd go to the casino all night, sit up and, because, you know, the time difference and that, I'd be there at six in the morning watching matches and I'd make sure I'm watching in case she, her head bobbed up on the telly. Pliskova testing the skills at the net of Karolina Pliskova. Just to hear a voice. Even when she was overseas, she's just got a calming effect on me. I remember we were overseas and she was telling me it was the middle of the afternoon and she's like, I've got to call Brian, I've got to call Brian. When I got back to Sydney and we got on the court, he wasn't as light and happy. 
Uh, so I felt, OK, we'd perhaps maybe, yeah, lost a little bit of what we had gained. How many rackets have you got? How many do you like? One day, he was in a very down and strange mood. You just broke Pat Cash. You tried to serve it, and that, that broke? No, that was beyond board. He was very heightened, and I was, I was a little bit concerned for him. One morning at 6 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, and I answered it, and it was Brian, and he said, um not going to make it to the tennis lesson. He's like, yeah, I'm at, I'm at Caritas. So that's a, a psychiatric ward at St Vincent's and um, he'd had some sort of altercation in the city at one of the um, homeless shelters with the police. So I give him a bit of lip and they put me on the gurney and tie me down with whatever and I'm still giving them a lip full, as I do. Anyway, so I went to um, some lock-up somewhere. He was heavily medicated, but when he came out after a couple of weeks, we sat down together and it was amazing. He said, I, I really do realise, he said, it's me that has the problems sometimes with people. He said, it's not everyone else. He said, it's me. He said, I, I get angry or I push people away. He said, thank you for being in my life. We shared some tears. We hugged. Yeah, I still remember that. It was, it was actually nice that he could have that calm, that sense of clarity and peace. He understood now that he wasn't going back on the international tennis circuit. And he had lowered his expectations. I thought that was a real breakthrough. I think the direction then was to really try to get him back into a, a tournament. So I tried to get one that was at the lower level. So it's the big day. I'm off uh, driving now to pick up Brian. We're heading to Goulburn. He's playing his very first tennis tournament in 22 years. Know who's more anxious or excited, him or me? When I found Brian, um, he was in a really good mood. He'd brought me a coffee and he was excited. Are you ready for today? I've been ready for two years. <laughs> 36 right. years since I last time I won a tournament. All right, okay. All right, jump in. And where did you sleep? Down in Rushcutters Bay? Where you found me two years ago. Right, okay. Now you've got to be a very good boy, very respectful. I know you're very good 99% of the time. <laughs> Only 99? No, but you know you've, you've got to be... Now, yeah, the police very... are going to be there or not? The police? Yeah. No, there's no police oh. at an event like this. No. I was really trying to just get him to understand that this was your first tournament, not to put too much expectation, just to go out there and have fun. <laughs> Yeah, I think Brian's handling the situation really well. I think, you know, it's tough, obviously. This young boy's exposing some of his movement issues. So I lost the first set, and I think I broke early in the second, and I'd already twisted my ankle. You know, it's just nothing was right. A little bit of bad language got thrown around. The referee did have to come over and speak to Louise and ask her to tell him to stop swearing. Well, I said to Brian, if you just can't keep your language like calm, he's like, can you just please stay out of it? The referee had come to me and, and just said, listen, I'm going to have to pull him off the court. I'm going to have to default him. Silly me. Yeah, this has been a long journey for him to be out there, so I, I really yeah, appreciate it. You know, you're just being patient. Well, not next, next out all right. The match is over. All right. She gave him one more chance and, um, yeah, Brian was getting more and more upset and um, in the end she just said, no, nah, that's it, you're off, Brian, and she finished the match. Yeah, it wasn't exactly the finish uh, I wanted, but, look, it's it's been tough for Brian, but I'm just so proud of him for getting on the court and, and just being here today and giving it a, a good go. You know, for her, he turned up, he got in the car, he got on court, and he almost finished a match. So she saw great positives in that and a, and a great platform to keep going. 
All right, we got number two in the world now, so Rafa. Because Rafa's got the biggest forehand in the game, Yep. you don't play it. Righto. When she was in Sydney and available, she was on the court every day with Bright. I never thought for a minute that I would give up. How'd you go? Um, I think you might have hit that for a winner. I always thought that we could achieve something. Right. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. He just got a lot of happiness, I guess, from being on the court. Righto. The thing I enjoy so much about my time with Louise is we laugh. And I, sometimes I've got to stop because I'm laughing so much. What are you going to be serving up for Roger this morning? Body. Bullets at his body, all right, all right. He's had four kids, he doesn't need any more, does he? No, all right, let's go. We played against McEnroe, we played against Sampras, and he was Brian the tennis player, not Brian the homeless guy. Oh, did you get him? Oh, I think got him there. You got him, all right. I noticed an incredible shift in Brian. You could have great conversations, just even the colour in his face has changed. He just seems happier and healthier. I was really just seeing the change in Brian's life and it started to get me thinking that maybe, yeah, I could offer this to other people, I could really help other people um, in similar situations that, that Brian's in. So I wanted to put on tennis coaching down at Woolloomooloo and just start to really engage the whole community and that led to starting a foundation called Rally Forever. So Rally Forever basically started because of Brian. Recently we did a fundraising event in Manly. It was kind of a, a launch for the foundation. We had some wonderful people come along. You know, we're going to try to reach out to as many people as we can. Next week we're going to start a program with, with Hope Street. Um, so women that have come from abusive kind of situations. Brian was kind of the guest of honour. Really he is the inspiration uh, for Rally Forever. You have really just given me a different perspective about tennis and what it does for, for everyone. It was, I don't know, sort of surreal. And I said to everyone, she's got the contacts and I've got the bad mouth and um, this could work. And it's only just started, really. Brian was just getting more confident and just, I guess, being calmer and, and just growing. How's your tennis going? Good, yeah, I'm playing all right. I really thought it'd be amazing if um, he would be able to then come and coach for Rally Forever, and uh, he agreed. Yeah, let's crack it back nice and early. Good, Brian. I'm uh, trying to get my coaching ticket so I can coach legally. <laughs> Maintain that V-shape with your racket. Oh, missed it by an inch. Well, I'll be hopefully working with Louise. Yeah, good volley. And helping the homeless and the depressed and people who generally unemployed, stop them going down the wrong track, I suppose. Set them up for me, I'm an old man. Brian went and did his two days being on the court and learning new drills and yeah. interacting. Know what you're doing, so you hit the volley, go back to the baseline. Uh, we had a bit of fun, uh, had a few laughs and um, she said she'd employ me tomorrow. You're obviously coaching already and I would put you on the court tomorrow and, and have you coaching a group class. No, that's good. Yeah. Now he can coach legally. It's incredible because he can now go out and, and try to get some coaching on his own um, and also for Rally Forever. We got some new guys for everyone to meet Brian too. So we got Ian, this is Brian, this is my co uh, coach. We're growing rapidly every day that we put on a, a program. There's more and more people coming. Stay down, step into it, didn't watch the ball. The people that come, uh, it's so diverse. We've got young people that have had, you know, real breakdowns. We've got older people that are just feeling very isolated. Good. What's been okay. amazing is that already the people that are coming to our, our program on Thursday have formed friendships and now go out and play together. And uh, I mean, that just, yeah, makes me so happy. That's what it's all about. Yes, come on, feed him. Come on. Could you imagine them coaching Together. Bit lazy, shoulder turn. Beautiful. Yep. I mean, how far has this guy come? Yeah, good shot. Coaching alongside with Louise. Great shot. I find it very comical. You gotta let Sean have a go. That's it. Because she talks a million miles an hour. Put her helmet on there. So I just sit beside her and let her take the stage and I'll just stand there and hit volleys all day. Try to beat me. Here we go. She said her life has changed since she's met me. Turn the shoulders. Here we go. 
whether it's made her think about what her role in tennis is now, I don't know. Brian has definitely had an incredible impact on Louise and it's changed, it has changed her. She is now dedicating her entire life to giving back to the community. That way a little bit more rather than your elbow. I, I, do, I just think this is a, a story of humanity and you never know where you're going to find a kindred spirit. It's just amazing what the universe can plonk into your lap. Anyone coming close to beating you, Brian? I don't know. Come on, come on, team.